Hello everyone, hello, 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 welcome to the Gamma Sutra Twitch channel, my name is Bryant Francis, your invisible voice inside your head. Um, we are here today playing what should be a very familiar game, um, it's Dishonored, specifically Dishonored Death of the Outsider. Um, this game just came out, it is a DLC for uh, Dishonored 2, though it seems to be, I think you can buy it standalone. Um, yeah, it's definitely standalone. Oh, and who is that? Who is that voice? We are joined once again in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen by Harvey Smith, uh, creative director at Arcane Studios. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Alex, who are you? You're down there. Man, that's a, that's a deep question. Uh, I don't know. Today, uh, I'm feeling pretty good about being Alex Waro, an editor at Gamasutra.com. Uh, Harvey, it's been uh, it's been a while since we had you on the show. You were on last year. Talk about Dishonored 2. Um how has it been since we last talked? Uh, how has the production process gone on this? Uh, and, and how are you feeling now that it's live? Uh, well, first of all, I feel uh, humbled and privileged because I have to say the team in Lyon um, just knocked it out of the park. And for this, the final piece of this uh, particular arc of the Dishonored games, um, they did... Um, they did an honor to to the franchise, you know, but um, it's been a very weird uh, project as well because I was living in France. I lived there for four years. Last time I talked to you, I was living in France. Yeah. Um, and toward the very end of uh, that stay, we started Death of the Outsider. We had been talking about it for a long time. We had been kicking ideas around. We we laid out the basic fiction. Uh, and halfway through the the project, I moved back to Austin, Texas, and so I vidconf occasionally with Dinga or Sashka or Christophe Carrier, a few others, um, Sebastian Maton, our art director. But mostly those guys, from about halfway through this standalone DLC till the end of it, they carried it on their shoulders, and uh, they're just fantastic. And I, I I should always include the tech guys in that as well because they don't get enough credit. Yeah. Uh, writing your own engine from scratch that does all the stuff that this one does is pretty amazing. Uh, even if our PC launch for Dishonored 2 was initially a little bit rocky, uh, they've done a lot of work. To, uh, we, we immediately jumped on that and we're patching it, and they've done a lot of work here for Death of the Outsider to enhance the Void engine. Uh, so you should see a, a, a prettier, you know, more stable, uh, smoother playing experience as well. So those guys, they deserve credit too. Nice. Yeah, um, right on. I'm just going to really throw out to the chat. Feel free as we're playing the game. We're in the first level, but feel free to ask questions of Harvey, um, especially questions about the game's development or design. Alex, go ahead. <laughs> you, you could just tell I was raising my hand. I didn't even have to raise it. You just felt it yeah, across I'm like 400 miles. My question is, where are you at, Alex? Because it looks like you're in oh. like a bathroom or something. It's that, like a... That is a great question. Um, uh, welcome back to the States. Uh, Brian and I are both in California. I'm up in the North Bay, and I'm actually in uh, a closet. I'm in a, I'm in a converted closet, so nice. it's very cozy. It's got good acoustics. Um, it's a uh, sound booth. That's right, yeah. I, uh, uh, also, if I'm distracted, it's because we're fostering kittens, and they keep sort of scratching at the door wanting to know what we're doing in here. Wow. Um, <laughs> we got to see the kittens now. Come on. <laughs> um, well, no promises. We'll see how the stream goes. Yeah. All right, so... Okay. Uh, something that jumps out at me about what you just said uh, is that this is basically uh, a conclusion, right, to the uh, the the Caldwin saga in Dishonored, and like it's not, it's rare that I get to talk to a developer who very consciously gets to end their game, like end their game franchise, end their game series, write an ending at all. It so often feels like people are constantly unsure of whether the, whether this will be the last project they get to work on in this universe or with this engine or whatever. Um, yeah. How did the decision come about to to close things out, and how did you approach it? Yeah, so that's an interesting question, and it would be very easy here to accidentally sound like some sort of genius auteur that had every piece planned out on a, on a you know a whiteboard like you know eight years ago, um, and that's not quite the way we work. You know, from day one on Dishonored, uh, Rafael Colantonio and I, the team in Lyon, the team in Austin. Uh, Ricardo Bear, all these guys that, that, that we've worked with on this this franchise. Um, and then toward the second half of it, Dinga Bacaba, uh, you know, all the way through Christophe Carrier, of course. Mm. All those guys, like, we more, like, look at it and say, what's the next step we want to make? 
given the situation on the ground right now, and we sort of plan something. But also in the back of our heads, I would say across the entire thing, we have some ideas. And uh, I've said this elsewhere, but here's the here's the. So it's very hard because people will try to pin you down on well, you said this, but you also said that, and it's like because the whole process is so crazy organic, it would blow your mind if you knew how organic it was. But but one little tidbit I can tell you is that. Uh, about five years ago is the first time I started talking to people on the team about killing the outsider and and our initial concept for that eventual DLC following Dishonored 2 was the end of the outsider and then some point we started calling it the death of the outsider and then we abandoned that title and for a long time in development we used other titles we used Dead Hand which is kind of a an allusion to the Russian uh, the Soviet uh, missile plan you know the idea of Dowd striking from the grave. Um, we used Blackheart at some point as a, as a project title. Mm -hmm. But in any case, um, we eventually were casting about trying to decide what to finally call it. And I said, well, you know, way back in the day, at the very onset of Dishonor 2, we called it Death of the Outsider. And marketing went, oh my God, we love that, you know. And so we all talked about it and, and ended up using that. But but that makes it sound like we had this plan five years ago, and that's not really true. What we had is like the high-level idea that at the end of this big arc, starting with the murder of Jessamine Caldwin, where all of these things have, have revolved around people's emotional reactions to that, Corvo's, Dowd's, Emily's, uh, and now at some level Billy's, uh, especially in Dishonored 2. Uh, you know, there'll be spoilers in this, but, you know, she's also Megan Foster in Dishonored 2. Mm -hmm. Um and so, long story short, what I wanted to say, though, is, um, you know, despite having the idea five years ago, we, the team, talking about, you know, ending on, on that, it was really only later, toward the end of Dishonored 2, that Dinga and I and others, Sashka, started talking about using uh, Billy Lurk as the protagonist and going after her old mentor, Dowd, and, and the pieces just started falling into place. And so it's, it's a bit of a long-range strategy, coupled with what's going on right now and how did we wrap that last thing up and what could we do next and what makes sense what did the audience respond to so it's 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 you know planning married with uh improvisation hmm. how do you know as a team when the right time uh comes to end a series like uh, how did you know it made sense that this was the point to sort of close things out on yeah, I'm not comfortable saying this is the end of the Dishonored games, by the way, because okay. we haven't announced anything um, for the future. But what I've been trying to say, and it's a nuanced version of it, right, is this is definitely the end of the Jessamine Caldwin cycle, right? Mm. So, like, starting with the Rat Plague and her murder, going through her lover, the man who killed her, her daughter, and now Billy Lurk bringing it all to a close, saying, uh, you know, this has to stop. Um it, it, it just feels very good. It feels like all of one piece, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, one piece feeds into the next piece. Um, yeah, so. right on. Okay, so, um, you know, as, as you sort of close the book on this this uh, this this chapter of Dishonored, I wonder, um, and this will be tricky because Brian is uh, is currently applying through the opening uh, in an effort not to make, uh, to make this a very approachable stream for folks who are just now getting access to the game. Um, but we haven't seen all the powers yet, and we haven't really had a chance to to see all the uh, the ways they can be employed to solve problems. Um, something I really want to talk about that, that that jumped out to me about this DLC is uh, there's a power in there I think called semblance. There's a power in there that allows the player to um, adopt the visage of an enemy, and yeah. that seems like a huge deal for me as someone who's played a lot of these games uh, and is constantly trying to stay out of sight. Like the notion that you can sort of do social camouflage. Uh, seems like it has a lot of interesting ramifications for how you design levels. Um, is that on point, or did was it like? Can you talk a bit about how that feature came to be implemented and what challenges it brought? Yeah. So I, I anytime someone asks about semblance, I have to say a couple of things. One is the way it came together is amazing. As mm. uh, I think earlier, Jerome Brown, one of our senior uh, game systems designers, tweeted about how many different pieces had to come together for semblance to be as cool as it is. From VFX to animation, object design, uh, narrative design, level design, it, it, you know, programming over all of it, you know, it's uh, sound as you take someone's face. It's all, it's all like in symphony. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the other other two things, it's the I have to say is it's the power that I was the most dubious about. Mm-hmm. Like early on, I was like, I pitched a couple. I think Dingo pitched a couple. The game design team pitched a couple. You know, like they they always come from the team in different pieces. And we, even if you pitch something, someone else makes it better by suggesting something else, some constraint or whatever. But we were kicking around the powers for Billy. Uh, about to start prototyping and people really wanted to do this identity stealing power and I was so dubious because I was like yeah we've seen Hitman you can take costumes you know Corvo possesses people and can walk past their allies and so we've seen variations of this off and on and it has these problems there's invariably there's some situation where you take someone's face and then you walk in to talk to their husband or wife or best friend or whatever and they don't quite respond right and it shows you know, it lets you peek behind the curtain. The illusion is broken or whatever. Mm-hmm. But the team was so convinced. They are so passionate about it. And they just kept working on it and adding constraints and rules about how it worked. The level designers signed up for the challenge. The narrative designers signed up for the challenge. Uh, and they just did a really good job of supporting it. And so to such a degree that it surprises me. Like I, I, I was telling the story the other day. There's a level later where you revisit uh, the Royal Conservatory. It's months have passed since Dishonored 2. It's the lighting is different, a different faction is living there. It's mm-hmm. been updated, the architecture and all that. But still, you go back to this known location in Karnaka, and uh, there's a major scene that plays out at some point between two of the major characters, and one guy is doing, he's working at the vivisection table, and uh, someone comes in the door and says, "Hey, Brother Cardoza, she's waiting for you. You know, she does. She's impatient. You gotta hurry." And he goes, "Yeah, yeah. Give me a moment. You know, he's working." And I happen to be under the table where he's vivisecting this uh, corpse at the time, of course, sure. as you do, you yeah. know, in a Dishonored game. And uh, he keeps working and he's muttering and talking. And she comes back to the door and she's like, "You know, she's not gonna wait much longer. You gotta move. Get a move on." And so she leaves and he says yes yes I'll be there in a moment and so I was like wow I wonder if I choke him out and take his face and go to the attended meeting with her if she'll respond and so I did he he started to you know he cleaned up and started to head out and I choked him out took his face and then walked in to talk to uh, sister Rosalind and mm. uh, it all worked you know and I was just like wow man people went further on this feature than I even thought we were going to and so that's the first thing really thing that comes to mind is like this is a feature that people on the team in Lyon really believed in and they went the extra mile to or the extra kilometer to make it work um, and so yeah and, and we keep getting feedback that it's one of the one of the ones that people are really having fun with because what we try to do for Billy like early conversations I had with Dinga we we really try to make this less of a game where you can like stab people or throw fireballs hmm. and instead it's more like you have to get in someone's face. You have to physically cross the space or get behind them or get close enough to eavesdrop on them or listen to them. It's very visceral. And so powers like Foresight Billy has is my favorite vision power we've ever done in a Dishonored game because it's so much more active in a way. It, it doesn't let you cheat. You know, you stop time. You kind of astrally project. You see Billy leaving her body behind. You ghost around and scout where the objects are and the guards are, and then you snap back to your body, and time picks up from where it stops. So uh, anything could happen at that point. The guard could actually turn from where it was going, but but you have a glimpse of what you think is going to happen. That's why we call it foresight. Yeah. And so it's just an example of a very active visceral power, and the same is true of semblance. Like we just really tried to err on the side of making you play the game you know the the powers aren't so much a smart bomb in billy's case but they're just alternate ways to play the game yeah no i think that shines through and i think that's one of the reasons i actually find uh these games very uncomfortable to play uh i uh, at work you know i'm sort of the guy who always plays he plays the next system shock he plays the next dishonor he plays the next Deus Ex game um but many of those games are games in, like in that vein you can you can play quietly and stealthily and stay very far away from the enemy. You can hide up in vents. You can sort of like remotely project and look at things. And in Dishonored, so often you have to get very, very, very close to somebody, even if they aren't supposed to see you. Uh, and I find that very hard and upsetting. Um, but it's you, effective. Raph and I, uh, I mean, Raphael Colantonio just uh, left uh, mm-hmm. recently to pursue new adventures after running Arcane for 18 years. But he's a close friend and we 
we still talk every day. I see him all the time. And uh, but I, I can definitely say that early on, he and I both had the idea that the closer we can get you to the characters, and the more we can make you like stand a foot behind them in the dark or whatever, the better the narrative will be. The better the voice acting will be. The better you, you'll be able to see our character faces better. The tension goes up, and that's why you know Corvo does things like possess rats, and uh, you know he's down on the ground under the table looking up at the guard. And we have multiple scenes across the entire sequence. I mean, obviously we put the feature in auto crouch under tables and things like that. So we have scenes across the table, like in Dishonored One, where you poison High Overseer Campbell. You know, and it's uh, so here in Death of the Outsider, it's. You know, it's it's an interesting experiment in different ways. It's uh it's longer than DLC, but it's shorter than a full game. Yeah. And it's thirty nine bucks and it's standalone. So if you've literally never played a Dishonored game, you can jump in as Billy Lurk and and kill a god. Um so yeah. it's an experiment in so many different ways, but it does stay true and in some ways it's the purest expression of that that idea that we, we kicked around early on about making it all intimate. Mm. Were you worried at all? I mean, uh, seeing this game come out as a standalone forty dollars game that nevertheless, like, sort of, sort of wraps up um, a story that's been running for years. Um, were you concerned at all that, like, uh, this game might get mistaken in the marketplace or played by people who just wanted to jump into Dishonored and picked this one because it was the latest? Like, were there any concerns um, from the high-level design standpoint of making this approachable to both long-time players and first-time players? Yeah, I mean. Like, there's always that worry that what you're doing is making the game for a more and more narrow audience, like, mm. that really, really loves your stuff. They get it so deeply. They they read every note. They, they look at objects to see, like, which company and which part of the Empire of the Isles this was manufactured. You know, is this Tibby and Steel? You know, they're totally, totally into the deep details of uh, all the characters and their sexualities and their history and their, like, you know... Uh, oh, I remember one time Sokolov said he liked this particular kind of food or whatever. You know that those that those people are your ideal players in the same way that authors have ideal readers. You know they they get you, and it's so gratifying to interact with them um, and to make games for them and to to hear them later say that the game touched them in some way is just the most powerful thing ever. But that said, you also have to constantly justify your budget you know and, and reach a wider audience you know so yeah um i remember early on dinga and i specifically having a lot of conversations about um and there billy was seeing a tear in the world and she's hearing the voice of the outsider yeah uh, through that but uh we, dinga and i had conversations about that and if anything we think that the high level the high concept unifying this particular adventure uh, killing a god is is more accessible. We think Billy is not royalty; she's not nobility, and so therefore she's probably more accessible. Mm. Uh, and then also it's standalone, so you don't need to. But but we Dinga and I did laugh really hard about the idea of some guy just like firing up his computer on a Saturday night and being like, "I need to play a new game. What's this? Death of the Outsider." Downloading it, having no idea that there was a there's a whole like you know. Uh, series that launched in 2012 that with all this rich content before you know Dowd's story, Knife of Dunwall, which is uh, Brigmore Witches, and any yeah. of that stuff, and just playing it for the first time and having the sense that he's missing something, that there's a larger picture here that he's not quite seeing or whatever. Um, you know that that's a pretty funny concept in in a way, but also yeah. it's cool, it's possible. It must be tricky to have designed each of these games, and by that I mean Sonic One, Two, and then this, uh, like to be both approachable and standalone, but part of a larger, richer uh, uh, universe, I suppose, for lack of a better term. I think a lot of devs deal with that to varying degrees of success. Um, you seem to be quite, to be quite successful with Dishonored. I wonder, um, is there a guiding principle when you guys sit down to lay out these kinds of of adventures with like how to design them so that they are self contained and approachable? but build a larger uh, narrative? Yeah, I'd say two things to that. I would say, one, one of the things that's really interesting about Arcane is how many strong leads we have that are very principled around their, their particular departments. Whether you go into animation or UI design or narrative or level design, you know, whoever you're talking to, people have very strong artistic principles around what they're doing. And 
and then we try to agree on them, you know, so we we all agree on, like, hey, we want to make the world seem much larger than it actually is. Mm. Uh, you took one path, but you had the idea that there were maybe five paths, and people don't just say, here's what you need to go do. They say, I remember visiting this place when I was a girl, and uh, I came here one summer, and uh, blah, 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 this happened or that happened. Uh, I remember eating uh, this particular kind of dish. And then so later you're playing the game and you you know, you know, go to a bar and you see that on the chalkboard that dish is written there for two coins or whatever. And it's like it just really connects the pieces. It's much larger than you could even see on one, on one playthrough. But then it also it hints at this larger world. And so it's very deliberate on the part of many different leads on the team, many different people on the team. And the only other thing I'll say about that is Arcane believes very much in iteration and playtests so constantly the producers are organizing playtests mm. where we're bringing in people we're watching them play very often they're streamed to every single developer in the building's monitors so they're, they'll be oh. working through the day while they have this going on the right and you know we have guys like Christoph who Christoph Carrier level design director who will later go get all the videos from the playtests that like we do at id labs or whatever and he'll watch like every single video and make notes and that's that's even above and beyond like i don't i don't do that you know i used <laughs> to do that and mm -hmm. and it's like i mostly try to get an aggregate sense of what everybody's feeling now from from everybody else doing it but christoph still does that and it's really really useful and so we you know where are people stuck where are they lost where they're lost let's don't just do the most obvious thing let's don't just put a marker on it or whatever let's try to find a little thing that hints them in the right direction or that draws their eye mm. or it, it, let's see and th then let's do another round of testing and if people are still not getting it then let's go stronger but uh, that's you know it's it's part of our values to try to give you the experience and let you discover it you know let you explore it yeah right on i notice um and brian please please chime in here did you just unlock some kind of uh movement I have the, power i have all the powers i have displace foresight and semblance so i'll test out semblance in a second well, you yeah. don't have all of them you have you have most of excuse them. excuse me i have all the starting <laughs> powers uh, yeah mr Harvey so yeah Smith. he's played through the beginning of, on the dreadful whale and he went to albarca bats and uh found doubt and now he's um in Upper Syria, I think. Um, you might say I think I'm that's what, making my way downtown, walking yeah. fast, faces flash, and I'm homebound. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got um, it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, Harvey, I'm going to jump in with a question here about semblance. Yeah. Um, we have now talked to two. We've talked to you, and we've talked to um, uh, Raf uh, about making these kinds of games, about making these, you know, intricate features that take a lot of resources but wind up defining the game. Um, you've both talked about being scared of these features and, like, how, like, there's something really intense that, like, winds up... You, you know they're going to take a lot of resources. You know they could totally sell, but you also know it could be really hard. Can you walk us through, like, where's the point where, like, you realize, like, it's worth overcommitting to this path, if you will, to, like, sand out those edge cases, to build that extra logic... To create the scene like the one you described earlier, like can you walk us through that process where a feature becomes like either really killer or you have to walk away from it and kill your baby? Uh, In the meantime, well, I will. What? Yeah. So this is a good example. This guy's painting here, and you get the sense that he works uh, around the corner. And if you just walked around the corner, I think there are some dogs that are hostile to you. But as long as you're him, you using his identity. The dogs shouldn't react to you. I'm pretty sure. So, um, but that's a, that's a case where foresight would have helped you. Could have zipped around the corner. And oh. uh, Billy also has a talisman called Rat Whispers, where you can listen to mm -hmm. the what the rats think. They've seen things. Um, See, but in any case, this good is, doggos. Uh, good doggos. <laughs> yeah. They're all good doggos. I'm just your friend, the painter, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, in answer to your question. It's just part of our DNA, I think, based on the kinds of games that we love, uh, that we have faith that if you put all this detail and all these alternate ways to do things, uh, all these little improvisational tools into the game, that some percentage of your players will find them and they'll have a magic moment. And that's constantly what we're going for. And by magic moment, I don't mean 
we scripted the perfect moment here or whatever. I mean that like at some unpredictable point for us along the way, and different for every player, there'll be some moment where, you know, you use the power in the right way and narrowly avoided some situation that felt very dynamic. It felt systems driven. Uh, a guard happened not to notice you because of a sound you made earlier and he turned a different direction or uh, it, and that's really why we play games looking for those those moments um, and so it's that faith I think that carries the whole team at Arcane along knowing that that's the kind of experience we're providing people um, the downside to it is it really, really works on certain types of players, and it really doesn't work on other types of players. And so there are people that just, like, you know, kind of sprint through the game, see a tenth of it, kind of don't get, you know, the best parts of it. But maybe they still have fun by blasting things and, uh, you know, drop attacking people and all that. So, you know, we try to widen the game as much as possible, but clearly it's made for people that like a particular kind of pace and a particular kind of exploration, and a particular kind of narrative. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just to follow up on that. Are you able to tell us, like, when in development you think a feature like that isn't working out? Because, you know, we're lucky enough to see these these features make it all the way through, but I'm sure throughout Dishonored's design history there's been powers that just never quite made the cut. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and you feel guilty as, like, any kind of lead on the team. If you've pushed an idea too far, you feel really guilty for making people work on it, but... We have examples of that. We have we have examples that we kill very very early in conception. Mm -hmm. What Raph used to call uh, I don't know if it was an Italian colloquialism, but killing it in the egg, mm -hmm. where we'd kick some idea around uh, and somebody like our tech director would go like, eh, I don't think we should do that because of X Y and Z. And so Dishonored Two, we had a power where we were going to let you walk on the walls and ceiling, like invert gravity, mm -hmm. and. Um, we were warned away from that very early, so we modified it heavily. It eventually became the power of Shadow Walk, which we were very happy with. Um, let's see, there was another example on Dishonored 2. Uh, uh, Emily had a power called Void House, mm -hmm. which just meant that across all the levels, initial in its initial conception, across all the levels, we were going to hide two or three portals to the Void that would take her to like a, a special place where... There was a house with a giant tree growing in it in the void, and it the whole place was reflective of the current chaos state. And lots of little things that she had done along the way would be like, you know, uh, maybe somewhere there's a giant mound of bodies on a little island floating out nearby or whatever for all the people that she had killed. Like, there were all these ideas we kicked around, like a little library, a table full of food, you know. Um, and we carried that idea along and carried that idea along, and then we finally just cut it. And it was very painful to cut, but it was also the right call. Um, so you just develop this sense of like, well, we're running out of time, everything's too compressed, this idea is further along than that idea, this one we don't know exactly how we're going to resolve it, uh, how, how it, whether it's going to be cool or not. Um, so anyway... Um, mm -hmm. Right on. Yeah. No. Yeah. That. Yeah. So, something that uh, jumps out at me, and, and Brian sort of just asked my question for me, which is amazing. Thank you, Brian. Um, okay. As we sort of like, uh, as we as we dig into like um, the inner oh, workings these are of the our contracts, by the way. Right. Yeah, I did one Ooh. of them in the last mission. Okay. With, they're like uh, to explain them to the audience. They're a neat little side quest thing where you can, you, in the same environments that you're carrying out your assassinations in, there are little things you can do. Um, uh, to uh, make some cash on the side to buy buy stuff. I screwed up one contract last game for some reason. I had the recipe, but I guess I didn't deliver it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, but I was able to take care of the dog, the poor doggo from the last mission. Um, so I'm just going to figure out which one of these I'm going to do right now. Do the bartender. Yeah, People really cool. love the mime, by the way. Oh, never mind. Do the mime. Yeah, it's it's pretty funny. Uh, that idea that as an idea that came from someone on the team, I had no idea. Uh, that it was coming, and then one build, I was like, "Oh my god, we have a mime mission! It's amazing." Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So, like, as as we talk about this strange alchemy um, that these games are, you know, this is a weird mix of uh, systems and mechanics and and level design and AI that that leaves room for players to sort of make their own fun in a way and solve their own yeah. problems their own way. Uh, we talk about that and and how tricky it is to to get that right. Um, and I kind of want to dig into, if you're up for talking about it, 
what Arcane's production process looks like, because it seems like there are some games that are easy, not not easy, but so are, there are straightforward in terms of scope, right? You like you set what you want to accomplish, you you set how many levels there are. It's a puzzle game or whatever, and then you sort of like break it out. And there's there's still lots of room for errors and overscoping and stuff. But with a game like this, I don't even know how you begin scoping out um, what you're going to do or how long it's going to take you to do it. So like sort of as a follow up to the the comment about having strong leads how do you how do you block out a production process for a game like dishonored yeah so it's uh it's very painful half the time Mm -hmm. um you know i would imagine if you were working on a game and it was your third iteration in the tie in the series or whatever your third installation in the series you'd be like well we know how much time it takes to make these levels of this size uh, we have a new weapon, but we prototyped it. You know, it, it, there's some known quantities. Like shooting a film is probably like producers in film probably just get to this point where they like uh, they can look at a page of the script and say this is this many minutes and yeah. it costs this amount. And in games, it's incredibly hard if you're doing anything that's R and D, if you're doing anything that's organic. Um, and so I would say we're from all the companies I've worked with and talked to, we're much more organic than many of them, which sometimes does lead to some pain um, in terms of like cutting things fairly late, like entire levels or features. Um, and sometimes it's un- a, a, you deal with a great deal of uncertainty because you're not really sure mm. that something's going to be great until the very end. I mean, to give you an example... One of my favorite levels in this, in Death of the Outsider, is when Billy Lurk has to go rob a bank looking for an ancient artifact. And it's a really cool, grandiose, 1850s steampunk bank. Um, and the level designer on it was Dan Todd. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head the architect. Mm. Um, but a whole team of people obviously worked on it. I'm not giving credit to all of them. That's unfair. But uh, but Dan's level in, in Dishonored 2 was uh, the Clockwork Mansion. (laughs) And early on, that was an idea that Christophe Carrier really carried. Uh, He's loved that idea for ages, a house with moving walls and floor and ceiling. It sounded great to me if we could pull it off. Early on, we were prototyping with Unreal, Mm. and it looked amazing, like, you know, pieces moving around and all that. But then as we started rolling on our own engine, it was a very long time before that worked, that and so there were moments in production where people were like, are you sure we want to pursue this? Because, you know, none of it works yet. It all looks great, but it doesn't move yet. You know, the right. transformations aren't happening. And it, fairly late that came together. Uh, but it was just something we all had such a strong opinion about that that, that level and a crack in the slab were going to be signature moments for Arcane uh, that we stuck to it and stuck to it and stuck to it. Uh, and we had to give up other things along the way. But... Um, in any case, uh, yeah, it's very organic and uh, it's uh, ongoing. You, you constantly evaluate the whole package and uh, check in where it's at and uh, see what you can do to scope it, you know. But it's uh, it's not a known process the way it often is at other companies, I think. Yeah, that's that's tricky to unpack. And like, uh, uh, I, I hate to to sort of like keep asking for for examples of failure um but you know like we have a lot of students and game developers who watch streams like this and later they watch the videos and um it's it's fantastic to hear about things that are risky like the clockwork mansion that pay off um were there any examples of things in production on dishonor 2 or on the death of the outsider that you guys really wanted to stick to um but had to end up uh cutting at the last second oh yeah totally we had a a Dishonored 2 level called the Wind Corridor where at the peak of Shindere Peak, the the, the cleft in it, uh, powerful winds would blow through and we had turbines and more windmills and all that. And uh, there was a prototype where like once the alarms started sounding, these huge alarms, the winds would begin building up and all the workers would like go inside and shut doors and anybody caught outside would start to struggle against the wind and then finally be blown away Hmm. and it was pretty cool you know it was big epic over the top and we ended up cutting it uh but we preserved the windmill technology driving things like the wall of light and uh you know powering security devices and in death of the outsider there's a new security device uh called the safeguard floor 
that we pitched at least in Dishonored 2 but didn't have time for so we so we really wanted to give it its due mm. uh, so we put it in here and, and spent a lot of more time prototyping it and all that but but that's one example of, of a level that we cut fairly late that was uh, you know it was going to be another of our big signature uh, levels that you'd move through the space and periodically these alarms would sound and the wind would kick up and you could do things with the wind you know like jumps would you know carry you a much greater distance because of the wind power and all that but uh, that's an example of where it just didn't work out another example is initially we planned many different physics puzzles where we had like uh, you know yeah. uh, these sharks hanging on meat hooks where you could put a spring razor and on the shark and push the shark down the line and as it got closer to people it would trigger and it it would mm -hmm. cut up the shark's body and anybody that was that it bumped into or whatever um, and we still do have some physics interactions of course in Dishonor 2 and Death of the Outsider but um, you know not as many as we initially planned just because Sometimes the way you play, like observing, strategizing, pouncing like a lion, you know, sneaking at first and then pouncing, mm. is maybe a little bit at odds with um, some of the physics interactions. Uh, whereas if your game was really about physics interactions, like Gary's Mod or whatever, then, uh, then uh, you know, it fits in better. So you're constantly massaging the whole. And even things that you love and you have a high degree of excitement for, sometimes you have to be disciplined and, and let it go, you know. You constantly should be reevaluating the aggregate of your game. Like one of the things Raf and I did, I often tell students and people like that when I talk to them, mm -hmm. is that Raf and I had this exercise that we did, I would say bi-weekly, like every other week we did it, uh, where we just say, okay, here's the game. And we'd go to a whiteboard, and we shared an office at the time. We'd either go to a whiteboard or the office had a window looking out on the rest of the open floor space, and we'd either use the glass and some whiteboard markers or we'd use the whiteboard and we'd just go like okay over here we have the AI stuff you know like sneaking what was that was it just a rat you know here we have the combat suite first person melee here we have the inventory items the gadgets the spring razor the, the crossbow the, the telescope you know here we have bone charms uh, later in Dishonored 2 that became bone charm crafting and we just like think about like is there enough stuff in this area and how often am I going to switch from this activity to this activity and then back to this activity and then something will pull me over to this activity how oh, important shit. is the narrative layer uh, <laughs> and so he we just constantly friend. look at the whole game as an experience try to write out what it would be like as an emotional experience hmm. how tedious it was versus how dynamic it was is it too overwhelming by contrast on a whiteboard, and we just do it over and over. And so sometimes we'd kill entire entire areas. Uh, and I, I actually, I think that's where bone charms came from. Is that we, in doing that exercise, at some point it was a little the the game was a little too pure. Mm -hmm. It was missing that one little extra detail where you could customize your character or find some other little trinket in the world mm -hmm. that would modify your mechanics a little bit. That would give you that one extra little thing to play with. And so every time we'd look at it and look at it and look at it, we do that with the creatures, we do that with the powers, etc. And I think based on that, that's when we added the... That's probably how the bone charms were, were added, I'm pretty sure. And probably in an ancillary conversation or a corollary conversation to that is probably where we added the non-lethals for all the major targets. Uh, hmm. It sprang from that as well. Just looking at the the right word you know like your game as an overall experience you know what all it includes and what it doesn't include yeah it um that's 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 kind of surprising because what, what i think is so interesting about dishonored as a series is that um it leaves a lot of room for the player to express themselves through play uh and one of the key ways you can do that is by choosing not to kill your targets that you are sent to kill yeah um and like the, the notion that, that that just sort of came out of uh, a whiteboard sketch one week uh, is uh, is striking. Um, well, many things along the way, I don't recall how they happened or whatever, but right. that one's very specific because I remember Raph and I were in this meeting, and again, we shared an office at that point, and so we were just sitting there shooting the shit back and forth about the game, anxious as usual, wanting people to love it. But it was mm -hmm. pretty early on in development. So at this point, programmers are working with game designers on features that we're playtesting, Level designers are all working on their levels that we're playtesting, you know, and, and we're going back and forth about 
how our reactions to those things are and what we should fight for cuts around or additions to. Yeah. And in th- at that moment, I remember us talking, and I was like, you know, it's true that because of Ben Time and Blink and also just the stealth model, wait until the guy looks another way, you can literally not kill any of the guards in the game. You cannot kill... The civilians run from you. So it's literally only true that you have to currently kill the main targets. And I said, I bet we could come up with... Because we only have like nine main targets. Mm -hmm. I bet we could come up with an alternate resolution for each of those. And I remember Raph saying, that would be cool, but that would be really hard. And I was like, let's take an hour. Let's bullet out a bunch. We'll list the main targets. We'll bullet out... um, some kind of idea for an alternate resolution, and then we'll pitch it to the team. And so we went away. We wrote down Lady Boyle, Lord Regent, you know, uh, Overseer Campbell, etc. Mm. And out to the side of each one, we wrote something, right? Like find evidence that gets them convicted, uh, put them in a crate with a bunch of food, and ship them off to a far island. You know, we wrote down a bunch of things like that. And then we presented it to the team. And of course, immediately the team was able to come up with better ideas for about half of them. Like someone pitched the Heretic's brand for the overseers. Like Thanks. if anyone is ever branded with this, you're not even allowed to talk to them. You know, this symbol. <clears throat> that was a brilliant idea from one of the level designers, I think. Mm. And um, so pretty quickly we were like, yeah, if we just did the extra level design work and artwork and everything else to support things like the Heretic's brand uh, or reading out the confession of the Lord Regent over the PA so everybody hears it and he gets arrested. Yeah, that is some work, of course, but if you just do nine moments across the levels like that, then suddenly you literally don't have to kill anyone in the game. And that's a pretty interesting talking point, and it's an interesting thing for players who want to go one way or the other to be able to experience both of those. And so uh, pretty quickly, that was one of those flashes of inspiration, an hour of work, the team made it better, and then, of course, the team had to go do, like, you know, I don't know how many man months of work that was to, to yeah. implement all of that. But, uh, and, and we had to constantly play test and iterate on it and comment on it along the way. But, but that's a good example. It's just like, it, it's such an iterative process here. Harvey, yeah. I'm sorry. I have a quick question. I hated to, didn't want to interrupt that nice, mo- that, that, that set of talking. That monologue. Um, monologue. <laughs> that endless monologue. Uh, I'm just gonna, just okay, like... I'm just going to jump into the water now. Um, no, okay, so this <laughs> mime, uh, if I get the red X over this quest, does that mean it's done or that I failed it? Because I got that. I think it means it's not possible anymore. I can't, right. It's hard to see. So, but... so I killed him by displacing him. So you got to watch that twice in the stream. But, like, it said I failed the quest then? Do I have to make yeah, it? Yeah, read you probably should just read the description of the quest and see if it has to happen in front of anybody or not in front of anybody or he has to be unconscious or every one of the the contracts has a has a little wrinkle like that yeah oh you have to make um, it look like a suicide it says be smart make it look convincing oh it's an infamous suicide spot yeah, yeah there you go so <laughs> and there's there's an <laughs> you have to read to play our game uh, there's a there's also a, I think there's somewhere else there's a bunch of notes supporting uh, this particular area nearby is like a, a famous spot for despondent people have jumped in the past or whatever and so there's something in the game talking about how do we keep people from doing that or how do we convince them not to do that or how do we you know uh, but but that's the idea is that you could that's one way yeah. you, can, you can do that I'm going to come on. back to that because we're going to be here for too long if I just try to do that the Brian okay. Francis way so I'm just going to uh, for a bit. I, I just got to say, as, some, as someone who has occasionally tried to think of cogent, interesting questions while playing a video game, uh, it's not easy to do that live on <laughs> yeah. stream. So uh, Brian gets the hard job. I get the easy job just sitting here in a closet. Oh, and, my God. Uh, so many times doing press, we would be asked to, like, play the game and talk to the audience at the same time. And you mm-hmm. just babble like an idiot. It's impossible. Now, that's so, my job, babble like an idiot. <laughs> We just totally got in the habit of bringing two people so that, like, Dinga could play and I could talk, or I could take the controller and he could talk, yeah. or Raph and I would take turns, and it's just so much easier that way. Yeah, it's been fascinating to watch um, to watch the impact, like, live streaming and Twitch and YouTube have had on, uh, not just on game culture, but on game dev, right? Like, the notion yeah. that so many studios now are doing live streams, and, and many of them are learning how to uh, play their game and showcase their game and talk about it all at the same time without... Um, messing up or having a huge gaffe. Uh, it's a crazy thing, but like that's a topic for another day. Um, so, you know, 
I could ask you about this game for another hour, but really, as we sort of come to the end of our hour, I kind of want to know how you're doing uh, as a person. As you've moved across, uh, you've moved countries again. Uh, you're back in Austin, and I'm just kind of curious, what's it? What is there a significant difference between the game dev culture in Texas and the game dev culture in France? Um, it's hard to generalize like that. All yeah. I can think about when I think about Lyon. Um, the first two years, I was super excited to be there. The second two years were a little more grueling, mm. I, but it's not anybody's fault. It's just I didn't speak French. I was away from home. It was longer than I thought it was going to be. Um, but but all I can think about when I think about Lyon now, increasingly, is the people I I miss. You know, because there are so many good people there, and it was hard at times, of course. And I'm sure there were times. I disappointed them or something or you know like it, it we fought about things off and on but like in general the feeling was very positive and I love so many of the people there and I, I really miss them and but at the same time I had worked for years with some of the people here and many of the people um, a few of the people here I literally worked on Deus Ex 1 and 2 with mm -hmm. and so I also missed them and so coming back you can't be in two places at once you know and uh, I'm happier here, I'll say that, because I speak English, and that's my main thing, is communicating with people, and so, uh, but that's on me, you know, I went over there, and I'm older, right, so it's harder to learn a new language, and we're Americans, we only speak one language, typically, uh, and that made it really hard after a couple of years to, like, bond with, the team was fine, because they all mm -hmm. speak English, but the, the culture at, at large, like, feeling like you belong in the city or whatever, it just becomes really hard to uh, to live in a place where you don't speak the language. And uh, that was difficult. And I miss friends back home, and I miss American food and American culture, you know, of course. Yeah. And so I almost feel guilty because I, I have been back now since February, and I spring out of bed every morning excited. It's a complete reversal back to the way I, I normally am. You know, I'm very enthusiastic and positive and mm. part of it is i've gotten back in shape you know because if you're not careful with game development it, yeah it, one of the first piece of advice i give to all new people getting into games is like have some sort of structured physical practice away from work whether that's yoga or snowboarding or whatever it is you got to have something that is physical and gets you out from behind a desk um and yeah. uh, and 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 it helps, you know. To you got to watch the way you eat and all that stuff too, or it will just start to like, you know, uh, the, this kind of corporate office environment or whatever, you know. It's but but anyway. Yeah. So since I got back to America, especially Austin, I've been very active, and uh, I still chat over video conference or link with some of the guys I used to work with in France. But um, kudos to them because they the way Death of the Outsider turned out is just great i love it they're so good at what they do i miss them yep. uh, but at the same time i'm with ricardo bear and people like that here the guys that just finished prey uh raf lives down the street i see raf off and on all, all the time we work out together you know we go to dinner and stuff and so i feel like i have my life back and my i'm very enthusiastic and you know it might show like you know i was kind of like like i felt like i was on my last leg there at the end of dishonored too yeah uh, but Anyway. That's um. That's I think that's really helpful, and I think you know. I, I, in fact, I know you're not alone. Like so many game developers, you know, typically on, on when they're just starting out and when they're sort of getting their feet under them, but you know, all across the age spectrum, um, they have to move every couple of years. Sometimes, you know, like the way this yeah. industry goes, you know, studios close, studios open, projects get cut, projects start, um, and so I think that's a pretty common experience, and I think it's good to remind people that like uh, as important as your work is and as creative and passionate as you may be, like it's it actually makes you better if you step away from it on a regular basis uh, and just get your head somewhere else, preferably out yeah. in the sun. I mean, I've said it before, but like take an art history class, host a weekly cooking night with your friends, yeah. uh, play soccer, you know, whatever, whatever it takes, like um, get away from, from this. And, 
you know, Austin has the Alamo Draft House. Oh yeah. I missed the it showing the other day. They had an it <laughs> showing with all everybody dressed as clowns. Mm. Like all the people in the audience had to come dressed as clowns, and so I, I missed that. But I've been to other events, like the the zombie event at the mall where they bust us in and zombies attacked us. I did the Jaws one where I was literally it's at midnight in a lake yep. where they projected Jaws up onto the cliff wall, and we're all in the water in inner tubes. Like it was fantastic. So, you know, just like you, I'm super lucky in the the second half of my life I've been super privileged uh, I've lived in Germany I've lived in California I've lived in France now and I've lived in Austin Texas and um, uh, it's uh, it's amazing to see people playing death of the outsider we've all waited so long for this to come out first to be able to talk about it to show you Billy Lurk to show you the new powers foresight is one of my favorites hook minds just another shout out to the game design team and the programmers that worked on that uh, semblance of course uh and the lore the 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 story the the narrative design i think people are really going to dig that the ones that are into the dishonored world so uh yeah yeah totally uh brian i've kind of trampled all over your uh lines of question during this hour do you have anything you want to squeeze in as we wrap up uh i do real quick checking my question list um what uh harvey what a lot of there's been a lot of changes happening in game design. Zelda and and Super Mario Odyssey are coming around the bend. Is like seeming like even Nintendo is getting in on this whole like systems driven stuff. Um, what are you interested? You know, if this, I, I guess it's a lot to ask for. Hey, what's Arcane working on next? But um, what are you kind of interested in as a designer? Um, what do you think is a trend that other designers should be paying attention to? Oh, <clears throat> yeah. I mean. Uh, Breath of the Wild is such a shot in the arm for a lot of people, I think. Uh, but anytime somebody brings something like this, the Nemesis system, you know, which is like feels like a new uh, set of game design concepts. Lots of games are going more social with co-op. Uh, lots of games are open world now. There's just so many ideas and directions, and especially the indie folks that are. They're more nimble, they're more agile because their budgets are smaller so they can afford to like experiment with things. Um, you know, Tacoma just came out recently. Heat Signature is about to come out. There are just so many different games that where people are taking them in different directions. I don't know if there's one trend, but it, it still feels like we're all riffing on game design and what can you let the player do? You know, what is the thematic of the game and what are the verbs of the game? And... Um, we're lucky in that we paint this like lush world for Death of the Outsider uh, and all the Dishonored games, and we really go deep on the lore as much as an RPG does. But then we're we're lucky because we can take something like, given our structure, we can take something like Semblance or for- Foresight or a particular Bone Charm, and we can do some little game design around it and prototype it and, and put it in a game, and it fits into the overall structure. Oh, my God, I just noticed we have kittens. Hi. Probably no one is hearing anything I'm saying because there are kittens on screen right now. We did. We I got some kittens. <laughs> I deliver kittens. Okay. Wow, nice. Okay. But anyway, so I don't know if there's one trend. It's just that like we're in a great age for just riffing on game design. I mean, this clock thing is a good example. There was a moment we had these all over the world in Dishonored 1, this kind of metronome or clock or alarm clock. And there was a moment in Dishonored 2 where we were just like, hey, what if we let the player set the timer? It ticks for a minute and then it rings. And if a guard's in everybody, he goes, hey, what's that? And he comes over. And it's just like a little tiny thing that fits into this sort of thief-style game design uh, package but it's it's a nice it's a nice little feature oh my god that cat is so cute yep sorry <laughs> this is polenta and polenta came to join us as we say uh farewell to our yeah. hour good it's god is it Smith. time just flew by like i feel like i just got into this level and i've just been doing the standard brian francis uh, muck about and find cool things uh loop i'm sorry everyone i was hoping to kill someone for you today <laughs> besides the mime um you know, right. Polenta is such a West Coast name for a kitten, by the way. Yep. I just have to say, like... It's strong Bay Area naming. The other one is yeah. yogurt. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah, of course. All right. Um, you have been watching the Gamasutra Twitch channel. Thank you all, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Harvey, for being a great guest, as usual. Um, uh, yeah, we usually... This is what we do on this channel. We like to bring game developers in and uh, talk to them about their games as we play them. Um, if you think that's interesting, we would love it if you hit the follow button. Uh, we usually go live twice a week, and we'd be happy to have you to join us and ask more questions about the art and business 
of making games, be they video, tabletop, or otherwise. Um, I have been Brian Francis, contributing editor at GambaSutra.com. I've been joined by Alex Warrow. Uh, Harvey, if they've got any questions about if uh, those, you know, like say those wonderful students you mentioned earlier who, you know, you tell them stories all the time, where can they contact you to ask you design questions? Uh, well, I'm very accessible on Twitter. I'm just Harvey1966. Nice. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask, why is it 1966? It's a good year. You don't know? No. Oh, dear. I'm gonna look Interesting. <laughs> Let's end it there. I, okay, that's it. I don't get an answer. I'll see you guys. That's how we end the stream. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Bye. Bye. Oh, God. The Say kids goodbye. are cute. Bye, Polenta.